Imperial Wizard William J. Simmons appears before a congressional committee which will determine whether the mysterious Ku Klux Klan is just a nuisance or a menace worth investigating. And there they are, gathered at a table. And there's Simmons, the son of a bitch. Hi, my name is Malachi Juarez, and I'm broadcasting to you from the prison capital of the world, Canyon City, Colorado. Speaking of Canyon City, Colorado, that's kind of our subject today. In 1924, this town was ran by the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan and was the capital of Klan power, but in 1928, their political reign slipped away. They lost political power, but it wasn't until June 5th, 2023, nearly 100 years later, that our city council officially denounced the Klan. Today, I'm going to go over a couple articles detailing the history of the Klan's activities in Colorado and Canyon City, and then we'll read the recent resolution. The first article I'm going to read is by Meg Dunn and is the second part of a series titled When the Klan Came to Colorado, starting at the section, Revelations, Responses, and the Rise of the Klan. It was the spring of 1921 when William Joseph Simmons came to proselytize the select group of prominent men in Denver, but his arrival at Union Station was kept mum and the Denver papers never mentioned his visit. When Simmons arrived to Klan headquarters, he dispatched Klegels parentheses clan recruiters to Colorado. They silently added members to the rolls, pocketing $8 of every $10 membership fee that they secured, as was the agreement with the propagation department of the Invisible Empire. $10 would be equivalent to well over $100 today, so it was a bit of a financial commitment to join up, but it helped to keep the riffraff out, and at least 80% of the leadership during the early years were men who held white-collar jobs during the non-robe-wearing portion of the day. With offices in the Continental Trust Building at 17th and Larimer Streets, the Klegels built up membership in the Clavern until, on June 17, 1921, the Klan made a public announcement through the Denver Times that they are a law and order organization assisting at all times the authorities in every community in upholding law and order. In fact, they went so far as to proclaim, to the lawless element of the city and county of Denver in the state of Colorado, we are not only active now, but we were here yesterday, we are here today, and we shall be here forever. At midnight, just two weeks later, cars loaded with Klansmen posted signs on the Rivoli Theater demanding that they show the film, The Face at Your Window, which they declared, shows the hooded figures of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan riding to the rescue and portrays the final triumph of decent and orderly government over the alien influences now at work in our midst. Mayor Dewey C. Bailey condemned the Klan and ordered an investigation into the organization. He declared that if its intention was to take the law into its own hands, it would quickly be shut down. A probe was launched to investigate whether the Klan had been paying taxes on the dues money it brought in, and the Department of Justice set agents to collect evidence as part of a nationwide investigation. The Denver Express, a labor-oriented newspaper, began publishing exposés of Klan secrets. But for the most part, several newspapers and many leaders within the community took an ignore-and-they'll-go-away approach, which worked about as well as you would expect. The feeble anti-Klan response in Denver was not enough to quell the growing tide of memberships into the organization, nor was it enough to keep claverns from popping up throughout the state. Pueblo, the second largest city in Colorado at the time, embraced the Klan wholeheartedly. Claverns were established in Boulder, Fort Collins, Greeley, Canyon City, Grand Junction, and multiple other communities. Of the five towns that Goldberg researched for Hooded Empire, only Colorado Springs had any kind of concerted backlash against the Klan, with the editor of the Colorado Springs Gazette, as well as the chief of police, both taking particularly staunch stances against the group. It wasn't enough to keep the Clavern from forming in the Springs, but it was enough to keep it small, only 2,000 members, and ineffectual. In March of 1922, the Klan filed Articles of Incorporation with the state. Though there was opposition, especially from the Catholic and Jewish populations of Denver, and the state refused official recognition, that didn't slow the growth of the organization. In June, 2,000 Klansmen met near Estes Park for an initiation of 3,000 new recruits. There were, understandably, certain segments of the population who looked with great apprehension upon the rise of the Klan in their communities. In particular, the image of Reconstruction-era robed Klansmen making late-night visits on horseback, placing fiery crosses in front yards, and dragging people from their beds to lynch them was what many envisioned when they heard the Klan was rising again. But that's not how the Klan was done in Colorado. Parentheses, at least, not mostly. 
There were still fiery crosses throughout cities and towns, on mountains, and even an electric fiery cross on a church in Longmont, but they seemed to be used as an announcement of a clan presence, or as a centerpiece for a nighttime gathering, almost like a calling card or a billboard for an organization, a form of branding, if you will. While the Reconstruction Era clan used violence as a matter of course, the Colorado clan of the Roaring Twenties relied primarily upon written threats, boycotts, and political interventions. The clan didn't have to drum up prejudice among its members. The fears and anxieties of Protestant whites were already growing as a cultural shift began to take place around them. Blacks were becoming wealthier and they began pushing the boundaries that whites had circumscribed them with. Immigrant populations were growing in mining communities, around steel mills and sugar factories, and in agricultural areas. The problem with these groups weren't that they were taking away jobs, their labor was appreciated. The problem was when their perceived lawlessness, strange behaviors, or sometimes just their very presence spilled over into safe, white, Protestant America. There were two incidents in Denver where Klan members were directly implicated in acts of violence. On October 27, 1923, Patrick Walker, a member of the Knights of Columbus, a Catholic fraternal service organization, was kidnapped by five Klansmen, taken to a remote place and clubbed with the butts of revolvers. And three months later, a Jewish attorney, Ben Laska, was taken out of the city at gunpoint and beaten with blackjacks. He was then ordered to stop defending bootleggers in court. There were other incidents, some clearly perpetrated by the Klan, and others of uncertain origin. Basing this information on Robert Allen Goldberg's book, Hooded Empire, Ed Quillen summarizes the incidents this way in an article that he wrote for the Colorado Springs Independent. So we're doing a little bit of articleception here. In 1922, a black janitor named Ward Gash got a letter from the Denver Klan that charged him with intimate relations with white women. He was told to leave town and... Do not take lightly upon this. Your hide is worth less to us than it is to you. He turned it over to the district attorney and left town. About that same time, Dr. Clarence Holmes, president of the Denver NAACP chapter, started a drive to integrate Denver's theaters. The Klan burned a cross in front of his office and sent a threatening note, but he persisted. In the 1920s, Denver blacks attempted to integrate some neighborhoods and several houses were bombed, but no one was injured, no one was arrested either, so it was hard to know whether the bombings were from the Klan or just bigotry in general. In Canyon City, Protestant businessmen who weren't in the Klan were still ordered to dismiss any Catholic employees, and boycotts were put in place in an attempt to drive Catholic businessmen from the community. Some stores put placards on their windows with only the letters K-I-G-Y inscribed upon them. That stood for, Klansmen, I greet you and was a clear indication of where clan members were expected to shop and where Catholics should steer clear. Despite the fact that harassment of blacks, Jews, and immigrants was taking place, the lack of overt violence and lynching seemed to placate Coloradans who had initially been wary of the clan. As memberships took place, residents weren't invited to join in hate-filled rallies. Instead, they were invited to innocuous events such as picnics, car races, and carnivals, one of which at least included Ferris wheel rides for Klan members. As doubts were allayed, more and more people were willing to pay the $10 and don the robes. They started to see this quote, new and improved Klan, as a social organization that supported good old American values, an end to crime, and fun family events. When the position for Denver mayor came up for election in 1923, the Klan saw an opportunity to depose Dewey Bailey, who had spoken out against them, and put one of their own in place instead. Benjamin F. Stapleton was a Democrat, which gave him support from labor organizations, but he was also close friends with Dr. Locke, the Grand Dragon of the Klan's Colorado realm, which helped give him the support of the Klan. Stapleton championed true Americanism and vowed to wage a war on crime, lower taxes, and run an efficient government. Publicly, he condemned the Klan, but privately, he welcomed their support. This enabled him to garner both the anti-Klan and the Klan votes, which swept him into office. He promptly filled many government positions with fellow Klansmen. He also kept his campaign promises by coming down heavily against bootleggers, prostitutes, and gamblers. In the spring of 1924, the Klan vowed to get even more men into office. They held numerous membership drives throughout the state. 
Some employers refused to hire anyone that wasn't a member of the clan, parentheses helpfully providing membership forms at job interviews to prospective employees. The clan even threatened to kick members out if they weren't registered to vote. Rather than set up a third party through which to run members for political office, they shrewdly co-opted the Republican and Democratic parties as much as possible throughout the state, running candidates on both sides. They found greater success in the Republican Party, but in cases where the Republican ended up losing to a Democrat, the Democrat had often been backed by the Klan. On October 29, 1924, parentheses after primaries but before elections, the steamboat pilot had the following to say about the Colorado elections. Another article in an article. The Ku Klux Klan, which has captured the Republican Party in Colorado bag and baggage, has been tried out in other states and has been found wanting. It has been repudiated in Texas and Oklahoma, where it has been in power. In those states, it worked through the Democratic Party. It is not particular which party it works through so it can get control. Its published principles are rather alluring. Most good citizens endorse its public platform. The trouble is that it insists upon political action, and the slate is made up in secret. Members are given a ballot and instructed to vote it. That is always a dangerous procedure. Candidates should be discussed openly, otherwise great injustice might be done. Designing politicians are always anxious to get some votes in an easy way, and when they can deal with one man or one group of men in secret, there is grave danger that it is not always the best candidate that is given the endorsement. And in any case, real 100% Americans do not vote the ballot of a Klegel or any other man on earth. If they are real citizens, they do their own thinking and their own voting. Stapleton was up for re-election on the November ballot with Bailey running against him once more. Bailey declared that, If I am elected mayor of Denver, there will be no nightgown tyranny in this town. The Klan poured over $15,000 into Stapleton's campaign and provided vast numbers of election workers. With the record turnout at the polls, Stapleton won by a landslide. At the same time Rice Means was elected to the U.S. Senate, Clarence Morley was elected governor, and millionaire Lawrence Phipps, who may have been one of the Klan's largest financial supporters, was re-elected to U.S. Senate. The Klan also won a majority of positions in the State House of Representatives and the State Senate, as well as multiple other positions all the way down to various school boards. The Klan was flush with new members and had just dominated the elections. They must have felt on top of the world, or at least on top of Colorado. But getting to the top and staying on top are two different things, as the Klan was soon to learn. Now, you might have noticed in the last article an image of clan members writing a Ferris wheel. This is a pretty popular image, and you might have actually seen it before. The next article by David Goldenberg discusses the history behind the photograph and describes some of the political conditions in Canyon City. On April 27, 1926, the Canyon City Daily Record ran a surprising bulletin on its front page, right under a notice that the local junior high school was putting together a variety show. The local newspaper of the small central Colorado town printed the headline, Klansmen posed for picture on merry-go-round, along with a brief staid description of a parade of hooded locals that went from the Klan headquarters on Main Street to the traveling amusement park that had been set up a couple blocks away. The photo itself, though, wasn't printed, as the photographer didn't share it with the paper. In fact, it didn't show up until more than 65 years later, and when it did, of course, it went viral. The story of how this photo got to the internet touches on topics as diverse as Colorado demographics and the history of the Ferris wheel, but it also reveals the blind spots in our historical memory. As grotesque as is the image of the hooded men enjoying an amusement park ride, the spectacle was not nearly as unusual as many Westerners might hope. It's hard to understate the influence of the Klan in Colorado during the 1920s. The governor, Clarence Morley, was a Klansman. Senator Rice Means was openly endorsed by the Klan. Denver Mayor Benjamin Stapleton had KKK connections. Yet, the Klan's hub of power was not in a state metropolis. From 1924 to 1928, Canyon City, a former mining town in the eastern half of the state that had become dependent on the jobs from the nearby state prison, was the Klan capital. The Grand Dragon of the Colorado Klan was Reverend Fred Arnold, the minister of Canyon City's First Baptist Church and the chaplain of the prison. 
He ran the clan offices from the Hotel St. Cloud across the street from the church downtown. Even though the aesthetic of the clan remains consistent whether in Colorado or Alabama, in 1926 or 1968, the group went through different expressions of its broadly bigoted ideology. The clan of the 1920s had different goals from the one that came to prominence in the South in the 1960s. This iteration of the clan focused its hatred more on Catholics than black people. Intimidation, not violence, was its MO. In Colorado, the clan and seems to have only been responsible for a couple of beatings and no deaths. Despite the hoods, the group conducted its business out in the open with the imprimatur of the government. And so, it was the construction of a local abbey near Canyon City that got the clan's attention in the early 1920s. The Catholic Church decided to fund construction of the Holy Cross Abbey after a large influx of immigrants arrived from Southern Europe after World War I swelling its ranks. Local Protestants, on the other hand, were worried that the new arrivals were taking too many mining jobs and morally disrupting the town's temperate culture. The clan of the 1920s strongly supported prohibition. The abbey, on the other hand, now doubles as a winery. As a result, Arnold found it easy to recruit a large majority of the Protestants to the clan, and soon installed clansmen into every local political office often under the slogan 100% Americanism. According to the researchers at the Royal Gorge Museum and History Center, the KKK became so popular that children of local Klansmen often wrote KKK on the bibs of their school overalls and called themselves the Ku Klux Kids. By the time this photo was taken in 1926, the Klan's power was at its zenith. According to the Daily Record, the Klansmen were invited to pose for the portrait by the site's proprietor, William Forsyth. No, not that William Forsythe. A Klansman himself who brought his mini carnival down south from Fort Collins. In addition to running the fair, Forsythe also invented rides. In 1924, Forsythe filed a patent for an amusement structure known as the Andean Staircase, which uses a system of cables and pulleys to tow carriages through a diamond-shaped tunnel. A year later, he offered all patent rights on wonderful new riding device with large earning capacity for sale in the classifieds of Popular Mechanics magazine. It's not surprising to learn that the photographer Clinton Rolfe likely had clan ties as well. Like Forsyth, Rolfe originally came from Fort Collins, where he ran the Rolfe Studios. A 1919 ad for the studio in the Fort Collins Courier read, Say Dad, do you realize what a real man-like photo of the old man would mean to your boy? Think it over, then make an appointment with us for a sitting. After he set up shop in Canaan City, Rolf was profiled in the Daily American, a new clan-affiliated newspaper. After noting that he now specialized in baby photos, Rolf Riley noted, I like Canyon City as well as any other city I have been in, but would take a fiendish delight in seeing it take on a more liberal attitude of progress. Rolf's actual photo never seems to have ended up in any local paper, and may never have been published anywhere. Instead, it's likely that it was simply distributed to the clan members pictured. In 1991, a local family donated a copy to the Royal Gorge Museum and History Center, where it was kept in their archives along with scads of other information about the clan's brief hold on power in Canyon City. In 2003, the then director of the museum, LaDonna Gunn, wrote an essay called The Protestant Cluxing of Canyon City, Colorado, which featured the photo. From there, it leaked out to a few different internet forums like Reddit and Nidorama. The museum shared a scan of the original image with us. In the photo, the clansmen of Canyon City Local Chapter 21 aren't posing on an Andean staircase or even a merry-go-round, as the Daily Record headline stated. They're on a Ferris wheel, a symbol of modern ingenuity invented in Chicago in 1892 as America's response to the construction of the Eiffel Tower. Make no little plans was the directive that brought it into being. By the mid-1920s, the wheel was at its height of popularity in the United States. Sitting three abreast and taking up all twelve of the wheel's buckets, the hooded men face the camera. Like the five clansmen standing below them, they all seem to emanate malevolence, creating a surreal juxtaposition of progressive and regressive symbols. The clan would soon lose its grip on the city, and Colorado in general. Its members were voted out of local and state office. In 1928, Arnold died unexpectedly. With no succession plan in place, the clan's local office folded. The white hooded men who helped run the state slipped into the shadows, but photographic evidence of the clan's power obviously remained. This next part is just a tiny excerpt from an article about the 1920s in Canyon City by the Royal Gorge Museum. It's titled, Now and Then, The Roaring Twenties, The Decade That Metamorphosed America by Loretta Bailey. The KKK 
crept into Fremont County in 1922 and quickly infiltrated into most of the county and city offices, the school board, and some civil organizations. Their headquarters were at the Canyon Hotel. Local minister Reverend Arnold became the Grand Dragon and is buried in the Lakeside Cemetery. The tombstone on his grave has a symbol of a flaming cross. State conventions were held in Canyon City which brought in hundreds of clan members dressed in regalia. Cross-burning ceremonies were held on school grounds at 9th and College and paraded down Main Street. In addition, they published a monthly newspaper, Colorado Clan Courier, in Canyon City. Meanwhile, a small band of monks from Pennsylvania who lived in an apple shed had plans to build the Abbey High School. The KKK tried to prevent this from happening by using down-and-dirty shenanigans, but the monks were determined. And in 1924, a 100-room school building stood proudly in an apple orchard. The Abbey opened its doors in September 1926 for worldwide and local students. Later, the KKK and its influence was dismantled and driven out of Canyon City. Guy U. Harding was credited for uniting other prominent businessmen to push the KKK out of the city. This task force, along with Warden Tynan, stopped KKK members from storming the prison. The warden had a machine gun and guards posed by the front entrance. If you're still interested in this topic, I recommend going back through the first article. It's actually really long and has a lot of information about the Klan in Colorado. But now I would like to move on to the resolution adopted on June 5th, 2023 by the City of Canyon City's City Council. Resolution number 7 series of 2023, title, A Resolution of the City of Canyon City, Colorado, Condemning All Ku Klux Klan Related Activities During a Short-Lived But Appalling Period of History in the City of Canyon City. In 2022, Canyon City celebrated its 150th anniversary, highlighting a rich history of geology, paleontology, mining, agriculture, outdoor recreation, tourism, and a close-knit community. As the city prepares to launch into our next 150 years, we want to address the short-lived but appalling period of history when the Ku Klux Klan was in existence in Canyon City. This time period in history does not define who Canyon City was overall, nor who we are today. During the 1920s, the presence of the Ku Klux Klan was found across the United States. The state of Colorado had the largest and most influential Klan following of any state west of the Mississippi River. Canyon City's Klan Clavern was organized in January of 1924 and died out in 1928. In Canyon City, the local Klan's prejudices were aimed at the new construction of the Holy Cross Abbey and the growing presence of Southern European immigrants. Today, the historic Holy Cross Abbey buildings and grounds are recognized as a valuable cultural resource by our residents with a deep desire to preserve its beautiful heritage while educating the public about the full extent of its history. For slightly under a four-year period, the Klan ran Canyon City's banks, government, and had their own newspaper called the Daily American. The Klan took credit for passing bonds to build a new high school, elementary school, and water bond issues to extend the water mains to East Canyon. Crosses were burned in Catholics' yards, Klan members marched in parades in full regalia, boycotted Catholic businesses, and pressured Protestant business owners to fire Catholic employees. On May 25, 1925, the newly formed Constitutional Liberty League Party of Fremont County announced its purpose to combat the Klan. At that point in history, it was the largest ever political rally in Fremont County, with 1,000 people attending. By 1926, the League Party boasted 2,100 members in Canyon City and Florence, and the Klan began a period of decline. Anti-Klan movements in Canyon City were led by Harry F. Bowen, J.W. Foster, and prominent U.S. Congressman Guy U. Hardy, publisher and owner of the Canyon City Daily Record. On June 1, 1928, the Grand Dragon Fred Arnold died. His death, combined with a number of Klan leadership scandals across the state, led to the end of the Ku Klux Klan influence on Colorado. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of Canyon City. The City of Canyon City denounces the acts from this period of prejudice and hate. They do not represent the collective goodwill of the people of Canyon City. The City of Canyon City endeavors to create a community of citizens in which everyone feels welcome and strives to live in peace and harmony with each other regardless of race, color, ethnicity, religion, culture, sexual orientation, age, national origin, 
gender, disability, education, socioeconomic status, ability level, political affiliation, or any other difference. This resolution shall be provided with all archive and information requests related to the Ku Klux Klan. In honor of the city's anti-Klan movement formed on May 25, 1925, we declare Canyon City's recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human race as the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Dated this fifth day of June 2023. Some locals even try to push back a little bit on social media. Parroting a common motif I've been seeing, you can't just bury the past. The city's social media account responded with a very thoughtful response, which I find cathartic. With the modern rise of white nationalism in America, we need statements like this. Not to bury the past, but to keep the spirit of hate in the grave, where it belongs. Thank you for watching.